Good morning, everyone. I'm Sandeep Goyal, uh, one of the cardiac electrophysiologists and medical director of EP Labs at Piedmont Healthcare in Atlanta. Today, we will be discussing uh, atrial fibrillation and stroke and how management of left atrial appendage could help reduce the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. I have uh, no relevant financial disclosures to this talk, but I do have consulting relationship with uh, Biosyns Webster, Galaxy Medical, and Medtronic. So we will start by looking at a case. Uh, you know, we have a 71-year-old retired RN who has history of chronic atrial fibrillation, which is essentially permanent. She has a prior history of uh, TIA, and she has a Chad Swesk score of five. She has been on Apexiban or Eliquis for stroke risk reduction, but now she's having recurrent GI bleeding. And she was seen in my office to discuss alternatives to long-term anticoagulation. So uh, before we talk about how we manage her, let's discuss uh, why do strokes happen in atrial fibrillation? So a uh, lot of the stroke risk in atrial fibrillation comes from left atrial appendage. Left atrial appendage is a small outpouching from the you know, lateral side of the left atrium. And this structure is very trabeculated. It's got all kind of ridges and valleys that really uh, you know, promote stasis of blood in this uh, small area. When patients are in sinus rhythm, there is good contractile function, and with every atrial kick, the blood gets ejected out of this area, and there is uh, minimal to no risk of clot formation. However, when patients develop atrial fibrillation, uh, the velocities in this area get significantly reduced, and blood tends to stay inside this area, which leads to uh, formation of clot. And those clots, when they uh, break up and leave, they can cause thromboembolic phenomenon. And one of the most fearsome one is stroke if the clots travel to the brain. Uh, and that is why left atrium and left atrial appendage are so important in discussion of stroke risk. Uh, over 90% of all uh, thrombi that cause atrial fibrillation seem to originate from the left atrial appendage. As we can see, uh, this is a left atrium that has uh, developed a thrombus inside it, and, and, and that's really the origin of most of the strokes. So then the question comes, well, are, are all AFib patients made equal? Does everyone have the same risk of stroke uh, once you have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation? Um, uh, that's not true, and uh, you know one of the one of the things we use is this CHADS to VASC scoring system. This is really developed based on the population data, and we take other comorbidities that the patient has in consideration to really uh, decide on their risk of stroke. And you know we are looking at uh, their age. You know if they have congestive heart failure, hypertension diabetes, prior stroke, and things like that. And, and higher your CHADS VASC score is, your risk for stroke, annual risk of stroke continues to go up. And it is recommended that we anticoagulate, uh, you know, male with CHADS VASC score of two and females with CHADS VASC score of three. What, what else do we know that may predict the risk of stroke? So, you know, CHADS VASC is the only proven um, and sort of recommended score that we use currently. However, there is increasing data and interest in understanding the left atrial appendage anatomy because you know I think there is a there is a good chance that left atrial appendage anatomy predicts um, risk of stroke. Also, we don't have any large data, but if we look at uh, patients with small left atrium, tend to have less risk of uh, small left atrial appendage. Actually, tend to have less risk of stroke probably because the chance of stasis is smaller. And patients who have a lot of um, what we call a broccoli kind of appendage where there are a lot of these ridges and trabeculations will probably have higher risk of uh, stroke because uh, you know blood tends to pool in these areas much more easily. Um, uh, there was a small study published that looked at uh, you know shallower appendages had lower risk of stroke compared to the to the larger and more trabeculated appendages, but 
you know, at this point, that's not something we clinically use because it has not been validated. Uh, we can also look at this anatomy when we, when we do CT scans in patients, and you can see from the outside how, you know, in different patients, the appendage could have very varying shapes and that have implications for management of stroke risk. So how do we, how do we manage left atrial appendage-related stroke risk? So we talked about why uh, strokes happen in atrial fibrillation patients and whom they may happen. The next question is how, how do we deal with it? So, you know, there are several established things that we could use. There is anticoagulation, uh, which has been uh, the cornerstone of management for a number of years. And then there are, uh, you know, newer uh, treatment approaches that have evolved and are coming into the forefront now. So the second one is catheter-based uh, occlusion of left atrial appendage. And, and the third one is a surgical left atrial appendage closure. And all three of them have roles in different patients. And we would be spending a lot of time understanding, uh, you know, where we use uh, which of the modalities and, and why. So let's look at anticoagulation. As, uh, as I talked about earlier, you know, patients who have low CHADS VASC score, especially in, uh, in men zero or in women one, really are not recommended for long-term anticoagulation. They may need anticoagulation uh, around, you know, uh, some procedures related to management of atrial fibrillation, but not long-term. Once we start getting to a CHADS VASC of one or two, you know, it's, uh, there's some clinical equipoise and it is okay to anticoagulate, but it's also, you know, okay to not anticoagulate. And that's where there's a really big shared decision making has to be done with the patient. However, once we move on to a CHADS VASC score of two in men and three in women, there's really very clear data that patients should be anticoagulated uh, if we are to really reduce the risk of stroke. What are our choices for anticoagulants? You know, the direct oral anticoagulants are now the first line choice for treatment in order to reduce the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, warfarin or Coumadin is a first line choice only in patients who have a mechanical valve or have moderate to severe mitral stenosis. Uh, you know, warfarin has been around for, uh, you know, decades and ha was the mainstay of treatment for a long, long time, till in last 10 to 15 years where direct oral anticoagulants have come into the picture and they've really sort of, uh, you know, uh, replaced warfarin in large majority of patients. Uh, if we look at the dosing, you know, in, in warfarin, um, arm, we really, the, the dosing is really based on the INR checks and individual patients may have, you know, varying degree of uh, requirement with the doses of the medicine. And the renal function itself is not a big determinant. You really, we, we have to follow the, the INRs. However, once we start looking at the direct oral anticoagulants, such as dabigatran, also known as Pradaxa, uh, or rivaraxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban, you know, the dose varies based on the, on the renal function. And, uh, you know, uh, there is some, you know, there is some paucity of data in patients with significant renal disease. So you will see some variation in how, how the doses may have been approved in, uh, in different parts of the world, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, a little bit sort of a, out of out of norm in my mind because most of the time the dosing is pretty standard for most drugs across the world. Um, especially for Pradaxa, it's really not approved outside US if your GFR is less than 30, but in US we, we use half the dose. If we look at uh, Geralto again, or which is Rivaroxaban, we are really reducing the dose uh, once the creatinine clearance goes down below 15. And neither of those drugs we can use in, uh, in dialysis patients. Um, Apixaban, which is also, you know, one of the more commonly used uh, direct oral anticoagulants, we are using five milligrams twice a day with, if the creatinine clearance is good and patients are not older. And we use sort of a, a blended uh, method to reduce the dose when patients are over 80, their weight is low, and their creatinine is over 1.5.
and they have to meet uh, you know two of the three criteria. So elderly by themselves <clears throat> are not really uh, recommended as a dose reduction uh, strategy. They have to have either low weight below 130 pounds or they have to have a creatinine that's more than 1.5. And this is a lot of this is based on pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data rather than large population studies. And you know it is approved in US in end stage renal disease patients at a full dose. However, you know outside US it's not really approved for end stage renal disease patients. So there is some there's some degree of uh, you know variation that exists there. So, you know, when patients are on these drugs, we, we really want to closely monitor their renal function and, you know, uh, really screen for, for any bleeding events and, you know, intermittent monitoring of their hemoglobin and hematocrit is useful because early signs of anemia could, could provide insights into, you know, slow bleeding that may not be apparent clinically otherwise. So, uh, why do we need alternatives to anticoagulation? Why can't everyone just be on an, on an anticoagulant drug? So, there is uh, increased risk of bleeding with anticoagulation and, uh, you know, you could see uh, even major life-threatening bleeds. There is, uh, you know, high direct cost of uh, anticoagulation uh, for patients. Uh, both related to clinical visits for bleeding, there's need for monitoring with warfarin, and for especially uh, the, the newer or the direct oral anticoagulants, the pharmacy-related costs can be significant. There could be negative impact on quality of life in terms of if we have dietary restrictions and uh, you know some patients are not able to enjoy their uh, recreational activities due to additional risks. But the biggest reason is there's, uh, in general, poor adherence to this therapy and which can really lead to a debilitating stroke because anticoagulants are very dependent on patient compliance with treatment. And when I say compliance, it's not always within the hands of the patient. Sometimes there are other clinical and socioeconomic factors that impact either access to the drug or the drugs have to be stopped because of the other clinical reasons. So, and, and that's where, you know, need to stop anticoagulation for medical or surgical reasons for short term. It's certainly, uh, you know, one of the things that we see leads to a lot of strokes in patients who are taking oral anticoagulation. So, how do we know who is more likely to bleed? You know, there are two validated risk scores. There's ORBIT score and then there's a Hedgeblad score. I think we use Hedgeblad score more frequently in U.S. and it's been... Uh, it's part of a lot of the guidelines. Uh, and, you know, we are looking at things like high blood pressure, abnormal renal or liver function, stroke, you know, prior bleeding history, labile INRs, elderly, which is really defined more than 65 in this, which, you know, large majority of the patients with atrial fibrillation would fall into that category. And then concomitant therapy with other drugs such as antiplatelets or NSAIDs or, you know, uh, excessive alcohol use more than you know, eight or 10 drinks a week. And if we look at the score, we, we can see that a lot of our patients will have a high score and that predicts, you know, higher risk of bleeding. Um, if we look at the adherence to oral anticoagulation, we can see that uh, even in uh, a lot of population-based studies, uh, the adherence even to newer oral anticoagulation is low and a lot of patients are really, you know, in a, in a range of 40 to 60 percent for the long-term adherence, which leads to, uh, you know, leaving about half of the patients who need to be protected against the risk of stroke unprotected, which is really a big, big driving factor that we still see a lot of AF-related strokes. So, Moving on to the second part, which is, you know, left atrial appendage occlusion as a strategy for uh, management of stroke risk in uh, patients with atrial fibrillation. So first, let's look at the percutaneous closure. So, you know, what is a left atrial appendage uh, closure device or procedure? You know, there are uh, these devices that are available that are one-time implant that can close the mouth of the left atrial appendage and, uh, you know, they are usually performed in a minimally invasive fashion, either in the cardiac cath lab, EP lab. 
And you know, we, we take a heart team approach where there is a, a group of electrophysiologists, interventional cardiologists, you need the imaging cardiologist assistance and, and sort of you know, they evaluate the patients and could provide this therapy. The patient, rec the, the procedure is really performed from the transfemoral axis via the femoral vein, so it does not require, you know, uh, sternotomy or any sort of uh, thoracotomy, so no, no, no surgical incisions. Uh, these can be done under either general or uh, even now under monitored anesthesia care about one hour and, you know, either same day discharge or one day hospital stay for most of the patients. So there are two FDA approved devices that are available on the market right now. There is the Watchman device, which is the, and the new version, the Watchman Flex, as you can see up here. And then a more recently approved device called Amulet device, which is a uh, double um, seal design. And both of them have their advantages and disadvantages, but really they are, um, they are the two approved devices that are present on the market today. So the question comes, well, does left atrial appendage occlusion uh, work, right? So, you know, the trials for left atrial appendage occlusion started, um, you know, several years ago, and the first trial was the PROTECT AF, and then there was a continued access uh, registry, and then there was a second trial that was called PREVAIL. And if we look at just success rate of closing the left atrial appendage, over time, the success rate went up from 91 to 95 percent during these trials. And these trials, uh, the Watchman device, the first generation Watchman device was compared against warfarin. And uh, we can see that uh, at about 45 day mark, you know, number of patients were able to stop anticoagulation. And the success rate of the implant was pretty similar whether the, the implanters were new or experienced. So, you know, just looking at could we even do it technically, the procedure success rate, we can see that it started from about 90% during PROTECT in the early days of the clinical trials of the Watchman device till after FDA approval in United States, the success rate went up to, you know, somewhere in the range of 96 to 98%. And uh, so, so it's very doable uh, technically. Now, looking at... Uh, you know, data from these trials to see how did we see the clinical results of this device. So in these trials, once patients had the Watchman device implanted to occlude their left atrial appendage, at uh, 45 days they underwent a transesophageal echocardiogram, and if the device was well seated, there was no leak, and there was no big, uh, you know, uh, thrombus or anything on the device, then the patients were able to stop warfarin and, and, and the patients who uh, were randomized to warfarin arm obviously continued their warfarin. And if we look at the meta-analysis data, we can see that the, the Watchman arm, which were the original trials for the left atrial appendage, uh, was very similar to long-term warfarin arm in terms of effectiveness to reduce the risk of stroke, okay? Uh, the, the warfarin arm had more um, hemorrhagic strokes and uh, the Watchman arm had slightly higher number of ischemic strokes, but the combined stroke risk was about the same. Uh, and you know, overall, if you look at the all-cause death, it was lower on the Watchman arm. Uh, major bleeding was similar uh, because there were some procedure-related bleeding that, that sort of offsetted the benefit. But the non-procedure-related major bleeding was significantly lower in the Watchman arm. One of the things that it's still a little bit unexplained is there was a significant reduction uh, in, uh, you know, overall unexplained or cardiovascular death. It did not meet the, the statistical significance but was very close and we, we don't have a clear hypothesis for this. You know, the, the, the thought is that the long-term anticoagulation leads to sort of several, uh, you know, um, low-level chronic bleeding and, you know, overall, uh, you know, things that, that lead to increased mortality in some of these patients, but there's no, there's no clear uh, explanation for that yet. So, you know, if we look at, again, the data from this trial, the, the Watchman device reduced stro uh, risk of ischemic stroke over no therapy significantly, you know, you got 70 to 80% risk reduction in most of the 
these patients assuming when we compared them to having the device versus not taking anticoagulation, right? Um, as far as bleeding risk, again, there was a significant decrease in the bleeding risk. And if we look at this graph, uh, you know, it's looking at, uh, you know, bleeding risk with uh, Watchman or uh, Warfarin. And we can see that the, the bleeding risk is a lot lower in the Watchman arm over long term than it is in the, in the Warfarin arm. And there was a 71% relative risk reduction in major bleeding after you know, patients were able to come off of the anticoagulation uh, in the Watchman arm. So then the second question comes, well, we know that this device works and uh, you know, left atrial appendage occlusion, if we can achieve it, it uh, it's really helps prevent strokes. But uh, what about its safety? Can it really be done in a way that, uh, that is quite safe? And that's where I think this next graph really kind of helps us uh, look at the historical perspective of this. You know, the PROTECT AF was the first clinical trial of the first generation Watchman device. And it really had a significantly high complication rate if we're looking at bordering on 10%, which would not be acceptable for long-term you know, use of device because that would really offset most of the benefits. But this was at a time when the device was new, it was still being, you know, uh, there was a lot of learning as to how really to implant this device. There was no data or experience prior to this trial. And then if we look even in the second half of the trial, the complication rate went down by half. And the second trial prevailed, the complication rate moved down a little bit more. And as we have, we continued to look, um, the complication rate, this is with the first generation Watchman device, eventually came down to about 2.8% which became to a level that was clinically acceptable and really provided advantage over no anticoagulation, and that's where the device was approved for treatment. And, you know, this is sort of important to note that in prevail trial, there were about 50% new operators, and still there was no increase in complication rate compared to the, to the trial before, where all of the operators were the ones who were already doing the device as part of the clinical trial. So, you know, this is sort of another way of looking at it is that, uh, you know, uh, if we subcategorize the major complications that we worry about in any of the interventional or electrophysiology procedures, uh, you know, those are usually, you know, pericardial tamponade, uh, strokes, or the, you know, procedure-related death. And they really all came down consistently during this um, period of clinical trial experience, and then the post-approval experience, the numbers were even lower. So, you know, we uh, clinically, we don't use the Watchman, first generation Watchman device anymore. We really use the, the second generation Watchman device, which is called Watchman Flex. And that underwent its own trial called Pinnacle Flex. And I think for the current standard, that trial really guides our understanding of what is the complication rate and, uh, and where, where we stand. And so if we look at the Pinnacle Flex trial, the rate of complication was really about 0.5%. And that's really moved the needle into a very safe zone for this device compared to the previous generation Watchman device. Uh, the amulet device, which we t touched briefly on, you know, this was, uh, you know, the only major trial with that device was done head to head with the Watchman device. And, uh, and if we look at the overall, uh, you know, rate of complications was quite low in that trial and it was comparable between both uh, Watchman and, uh, and amulet. And, and we can see that most of the complications in that trial happened in uh, hands of the operators who had minimal experience. So, you know, if we look here, these are the operators who had done one to three cases. These are the operators who had done four to six cases, and these are up to, you know, 10 cases. So if we, first 10 cases are always sort of, you know, higher risk for complication, uh, uh, especially when that device was never used before and all these, it was a new experience for everyone. But once uh, you know operators moved beyond the 10, um, 10 initial implants, the, the complication rate really went down very significantly. And, uh, and the most important complication, which remains rare, is still uh, pericardial effusion.
So uh, who do we consider for left atrial appendage occlusion over anticoagulation therapy presently? You know, uh, some of this uh, data is a little bit older because it is based on the original approval of left atrial appendage closure with Watchman device in U.S. Um, so, you know, the, these, these devices are indicated to reduce the risk of stroke or, or thromboembolism from left atrial appendage in patients who have non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And I think it's important to understand that non-valvular atrial fibrillation is almost all of the atrial fibrillation except in patients who have uh, moderate to severe mitral stenosis or they have a mechanical valve. Patients who just have valve disease or have had a, you know, prosthetic uh, but bioprosthetic uh, valve replacement uh, do, are not considered valvular atrial fibrillation. They're really non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Only patients who truly, where we think the valve disease is really the main uh, factor in atrial fibrillation and where risk of, uh, you know, stroke is viewed differently are patients with moderate to severe mitral stenosis. So uh, coming back, these patients have to have non-valvular atrial fibrillation. They have to have increased risk of stroke based on their chads vask score, as we discussed earlier. And they have to be suitable for either warfarin or uh, another oral anticoagulant for at least short term, you know, for that they are able to tolerate it for a period of 30 to 45 days. And they have to have a good reason why they would uh, not want to take long-term anticoagulation or why they cannot take long-term anticoagulation. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, those are different reasons and we will discuss as we move along. So, you know, patients that we select usually have to be high risk for ischemic events based on their chads vask score. They have to be high risk for bleeding events based on either their hedge blood score or history of prior bleeding or, you know, occupations or activities that they partake into that place them at higher risk of bleeding. And the risk and benefit of procedure should outweigh that of long-term anticoagulation. But then, you know, the second step, which is also very critical, is evaluating individual patient anatomy. So, you know, we usually would image them either with a transesophageal echocardiogram or we get a CT scan if creatinine is appropriate and really look at their left atrial appendage to see if that is a suitable anatomy to be closed with one of the commercially available, uh, you know, left atrial appendage occluders, which could be the Watchman or the amulet device. So, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, which patients underwent uh, this procedure during the trials, most of these patients were higher risk for stroke as expected, you know, based on what we have discussed. And, uh, and that sort of uh, mirrored as we added uh, more and more of the, the newer trials and registries and we actually moved to the, to the higher and higher risk population for the stroke as we have gotten more experience. So, and most of the patients in these trials were also at moderate to high risk of bleeding with their chads vask score of ranging more in two to three plus range. So, which patients to consider left atrial appendage occlusion, uh, you know, talking about bleeding complications. So, there are a number of patients who are having either GI bleed or urinary tract bleeding, uh, frequent, you know, significant epistaxis or falls. And then, obviously, a no-brainer is usually patients who have had any sort of intracranial bleeding, uh, you know, subdural hematomas. Those are definitely very high risk for long-term re-anticoagulation. Uh, there are a number of patients who need to stop anticoagulation because they undergo, you know, uh, regular, uh, you know, procedures that uh, that really uh, require withholding anticoagulation. So a lot of those patients could be undergoing an epidural injection or, um, you know, uh, those kind of things are usually one of the common reasons. Patients who are still on warfarin and they're not able to maintain their INRs in a good range uh, could be considered for it. Uh, a unique group of patients are patients who are on triple therapy, which is um, patients who are taking, you know, aspirin, Plavix, or one of the other antiplatelet agents because they either have coronary or peripheral stents, and they have atrial fibrillation in addition. So now they're taking uh, three different agents to reduce the risk of stent thrombosis plus reduce the risk of stroke, and they really become uh, very high risk for bleeding.
Patients who have uh, significant renal disease, you know, we, we can use direct oral anticoagulants in those patients, but as you saw, the data is very, um, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not a strong level of data as to what dose to use, how effective uh, and safe the direct oral anticoagulants are in patients with significant renal disease. It still remains to be seen, and those patients tend to have higher risk of bleeding. And then there's a smaller group of patients who just can't comply with the regular medical therapy or they have lifestyle hazards that put them at a strong risk of bleeding if they fall on anticoagulation. So looking at some of the characteristics of these devices, you know, the, the first generation uh, device, uh, the Watchman device, was a, you know, nitinol frame, which is pretty standard in most of the, the intracardiac implants and it had 10 anchors that basically anchored the device in the left atrial appendage. Uh, you know, one of the, the features was that the front part of the device was open, as you can see here, and which really, uh, you know, uh, led to some increased risk of bleeding because uh, these areas could be sharp, and if they made contact with the left atrial appendage wall, they could really cause some bleeding because left atrial appendage is quite a friable structure. And I think that's where most of the pericardial effusions happened in the original, uh, you know, Watchman trials. So, you know, Watchman Flex, the second generation Watchman device, was really a significant sort of engineering uh, uh, miracle compared to the original device. And they took care of a lot of the deficiencies that the device had. So we got few more device sizes, so it, it was able to take care of larger range of patients. These distal tines were folded back, and really the, the front of the device is completely closed now, and so it has much less risk of, uh, you know, causing any injury to the, to the myocardium. They also added more struts, so the device has, applies more radial force, and it makes it a lot more stable. They added another uh, row of anchors, so now, uh, you know, there are two uh, different levels where the device grabs the myocardium and makes it very stable, even with a shorter size. And I think one of my uh, favorite changes they made was that in the original uh, Watchman device, there was a large metal screw that was exposed. And in some patients, that led to its own problem of development of thrombus on this uh, early on after the procedure, especially if they were not able to tolerate anticoagulation. They really, uh, you know, have covered that with the fabric, which is much less thrombogenic than the metal that was exposed. So, so huge improvement. In, in technology. And then the new device that has been approved is the AMOLED device, which really, uh, you know, is an extension of uh, devices that have been used for a while to close atrial septal defects, the AST closure devices. It's the similar idea, and it is a device that has a lobe and a disc, and the lobe sits inside the left atrial appendage and disc sits at the mouth. So you actually have double uh, seal from this device, and this device is available in several sizes and is able to, you know, accommodate patients who may not be candidate for the Watchman device or, or you know, they're independently suitable for this device. So really has expanded the, the treatment options. And if we look at the future of left atrial appendage occlusion devices, uh, you know, we are only scratching the surface right now. You know, we talked about the, the top row devices, and ACP was the first generation of the AMOLED device that never got approved because, you know, they had redesigned it uh, prior to approval. But there are a lot of new devices in the pipeline, and, you know, Wavecrest from Biosense Webster, there is a Lambre device, there is, uh, you know, uh, all sort of patches, and, uh, and just a variety of device designs that are on the horizon that that would continue to improve safety and efficacy of this technology. So, you know, how do we how do we do the implants? If we look at, you know, the first thing we do is we really look at the left atrial appendage anatomy. You know, we the, these are the views from the transesophageal echocardiogram, and these are zoomed views where we are looking at left atrial appendage, which is, you know, these are two biplane views. Uh, you know, looking at two different angles, and we can see the left atrial appendage, and then we can measure the 
the width of the ostium and the depth in various views. And that really helps uh, us understand what size device to use and if they are really good candidates for the device. We also do a left atrial appendage anatomy assessment by CT prior to the procedure if the patient's creatinine is, is acceptable. And that could really give a good view of the left atrial appendage and help us understand uh, and plan better for the implant. Yes, yeah, so the first thing we do is after we obtain transeptal access into the left atrium, we place a pigtail catheter in the left atrial appendage and, and really take pictures to reassess the anatomy to make sure everything looks good. Prior to this, a TE or intracardiac echocardiography has been performed to make sure there's no left atrial appendage thrombus. Once we once we see that, we remove the pigtail and we bring the Watchman device. The Watchman device really comes, uh, you know, preloaded in a small uh, sheet, and it's compressed, so you know you're able to deliver any size device through the same access system. Uh, once the device is brought into the left atrium and the appendage, we are pulling back, so we are really bringing the the sheath back, and we do what we call unsheathing of the device, and we create this. Um, this flex ball, which is essentially half of the device is open, and that creates a very soft structure that you could move around in the heart quite uh, uh, safely. And this allows us to sort of advance or, or retract the whole assembly to position it in a place that is, uh, that is what we would like to sort of have the final device at. And so the, the full device is then deployed by pulling the sheath back, as you can see the deployment there. And then once the device is deployed, we actually uh, you know, take the cable that connects the device to the uh, rest of the, the assembly, and we have access to it on the outside. And we actually pull on it to make sure the device is securely anchored in the left atrial appendage. This is something called a tug test, and, uh, and we look at the echocardiography to make sure that the device has had no motion and compare it to the previous position, assuming that there's no motion and the device is <clears throat> fully secured. We are able to then move on to doing another angiography if necessary and, and make sure that there's no, no leak around the device. The device's fabric is porous, so you could still see the contrast going into the left atrial appendage, uh, but it's significantly delayed compared to where the device wasn't in place. And, uh, and eventually, with time over you know, six to eight weeks, the, the surface of the device gets endothelized, and it would not, it would not require you know, any anymore, sort of the flow would not be crossing across. And then once we are happy with the position and confirm that there are no leaks, then we are able to uh, you know, release the screw that's keeping attachment of the device to rest of the assembly, and it requires few counterclockwise turns, and then the device sort of just remains uh, behind in the left atrium. And as you can see, the device is uh, moving with the, with the motion of the heart. Uh, also indicating that it's secured uh, very well. And the final device in the left atrial appendage, and in this patient we did with a transesophageal echo, so you can see the TE probe. And this is a very magnified view, so you know, it's a relatively you know, uh, small device, especially in this patient, but uh, uh, you can see that it remains behind. This is sort of the original Watchman in uh, you know, one of my earlier cases, and you can see the similar idea, but this device was open uh, from the front and, uh, and, and a lot longer for the same size device as I used in the, in the last case, which was a second generation flex device. This is a transesophageal echocardiogram uh, image after the implant has been in place, and this is the Watchman device. And, uh, you know, you can see that it's blocking any flow into the left atrial appendage. This is the pulmonary vein, which has a good flow. So it's a well-positioned device. So what do we do these patients after the implant in terms of the therapy uh, for anticoagulation or antiplatelets? The Watchman device was studied with uh, 
you know, oral anticoagulation plus a low dose aspirin for about 45 days and then the patients undergo imaging with either a transesophageal echo or a CT scan to make sure the device is well placed and then they can be switched to dual antiplatelet therapy for up to six months and then single antiplatelet therapy with low dose aspirin after that. Uh, if we look at the trial data, 96% of the patients were able to discontinue their full oral anticoagulation at 45-day mark. About 4% of the patients needed to continue it because either they had thrombus or they had a leak and they underwent re-imaging to ensure that those things had disappeared. If we look at the AMOLED device, the trials were done slightly differently and they did not use any oral anticoagulation post-implant and all of the all of the regimen included dual antiplatelet therapy. So most of those patients go on aspirin, Plavix for six months, and then they eventually go on aspirin or no therapy after that, assuming that their post-implant imaging shows no significant leak or no thrombus. So this is a uh, 3D uh, image of the TE, again looking at the Watchman device, and you can see that the device is, is well seated and this is where the appendage used to be, but now this is acting as a sort of a stopper for any blood in or out of the left atrial appendage. Now this is an image showing a CT scan uh, six weeks after the implant of Watchman Flex. This is where left atrial appendage used to be, and the white is, oops, sorry, the white is contrast, and you can see that the contrast is no longer entering the left atrial appendage and uh, the device is completely blocking any entry of blood in the left atrial appendage. This is a, uh, you know, a look at the inside of the left atrium and the left atrial appendage after endothelization of the device. So this is a dog model, and if we look at 30 days, the device is getting endothelized, and at 45 days, it's even further endothelized where it's hard to know where the device is. This is a human pathology specimen that was, uh, you know, obtained nine months after the implant at autopsy for an unrelated uh, death. And, uh, you know, you could see that the device was well endothelized. This was the original Watchman device, so you can see the larger exposed screw in that patient. But most of the times, the device is completely endothelized uh, at the time of evaluation. So, um, you know, that was more about percutaneous surgical, uh, percutaneous left atrial appendage closure. How about surgical left atrial appendage closure? And the surgical left atrial appendage closure really refers to left atrial appendage closure that is done either during open heart surgery or through a, a more minimally invasive thoracoscopic approach for closure of left atrial appendage. Um, and that is, that is something that has been done for a long period of time in conjunction with uh, open heart surgery. So the patients who were already undergoing sternotomy for either a bypass surgery or valve surgery, if they had uh, atrial fibrillation history, surgeons oftentimes would amputate the left atrial appendage. And there are different ways of doing that. You could use uh, these clips called atrial clip, a plain surgical cut and sew uh, approach has also been used. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> this, this was not systematically ever studied before, and it was done mostly based on the, uh, the fact that left atrial appendage is the source of thrombus, and removing that should reduce the risk of stroke. There is, um, you know, one recent major study that looked at, uh, you know, patients who were undergoing cardiac surgery uh, and had atrial fibrillation and had a chads vasc score of more than two, they were randomized to either having their left atrial appendage removed at the time of the surgery or not being removed, and then they were followed. Uh, one difference in this study is because there was no data uh, that was that surgical left atrial appendage closure certainly reduces risk of stroke. The patients were left on their usual therapy. Uh, what that means that they were allowed to continue you know, anticoagulation, antiplatelet, or whatever therapy that was deemed clinically appropriate without considering the fact that they have had left atrial appendage occlusion. So, you know, it was a large study. There were about 4,800 patients, and 2,400 were randomized to cardiac surgery plus left atrial appendage occlusion, and another 2,400 to without left atrial appendage occlusion. 
And if we look and follow up, the stroke risk was significantly decreased in patients who did not have left atrial appendage left at the time of the surgery. So the stroke risk during follow-up was 4.8% in patients who had their left atrial appendage removed or amputated versus 7% in uh, patients who did not have the left atrial appendage removed. Now this study uh, does not prove that you could come off anticoagulation because this was not uh, done or powered that way. But it certainly uh, you know, speaks to the role of left atrial appendage that even if, if left atrial appendage did not exist, then uh, you know, there would be significant reduction in the risk of stroke in these patients. The one other thing that you know, we don't know uh, in this study is that there was no post-procedure uh, imaging that was consistently obtained to know how effective the closure was. So we don't know if the left atrial appendage was very well closed in these patients and there's potentially higher benefit uh, that could have been obtained if we looked at the group of patients who actually had their left atrial appendage completely closed compared to the patients who uh, did not have it fully closed. So, and you know, there was there were a variety of techniques that were used during the study. So you know, there was a cut and sew technique was probably half of it. There was a stapler, closure device, and all, all sort of uh, gamut of techniques. And we don't have subgroup data on how, how well the closure was in one versus another kind of technique. And I think that's where the future surgical trials are looking at that. But uh, we at Piedmont Heart, you know, uh, if the patients are undergoing open heart surgery for unrelated reasons, but if they have atrial fibrillation and significant risk of stroke, then our surgeons would usually amputate the left atrial appendage or close it by one of the approved methods, uh, assuming it does not uh, increase the surgical risks otherwise. So, you know, we know that left atrial appendage closure uh, works for patients who have atrial fibrillation with increased risk of stroke, and it is currently approved for patients who uh, have increased risk of bleeding. However, you know we haven't uh, we haven't looked at patients who don't have necessarily increased risk of bleeding by Hatch blood score, uh, but don't want to take long-term anticoagulation, uh, and there there is a lot of interest from patients to consider left atrial appendage occlusion with one of the percutaneous devices uh, as, a, as a first line therapy. It is not approved as a first line therapy and we, we don't offer it as a first line therapy at this point. However, there are two, two sort of clinical trials that are going on uh, currently. There's a Champion AF clinical trial which is looking at the Watchman Flex device versus any of the direct oral anticoagulants. And then there is a catalyst trial which is looking at the other device, the amulet device, versus uh, direct oral anticoagulants. Both of these trials are uh, randomized trials. That means that patients would have to agree to participate uh, in the trial knowing that they may be randomized to continued oral anticoagulation or to the device arm. And, and I think both of these are going to be uh, a major uh, you know, landmark studies to understand uh, if left atrial appendage occlusion should be considered as a first-line therapy. And as I said, that we're looking at about 3,000 patients, 150 sites. The randomization is one-to-one. -one. That means half of the patients will get device, half of the patients will get anticoagulation, and they will have a five-year follow-up. The idea is to see if the Watchman Flex or in Catalyst study, the uh, amulet device is non-inferior to long-term anticoagulation as far as uh, you know, risk of stroke is concerned and potentially superior for non-procedural bleeding at 36 months. So you know, there are patients who would be appropriate for these studies are the ones who have a documented uh, you know, atrial fibrillation with higher Chats-Vask score and they should be able to take long-term anticoagulation uh, these are uh, patients who don't have to have a reason to seek a non-pharmacological alternative, uh, which is the population for which we currently do left atrial appendage closure. And uh, so, the, the most of the most of the screening looks at uh, you know we assess their uh, 
uh, their left uh, ventricular uh, function by an echocardiogram. Then they undergo the device implant, and then they have a four-month follow-up with a TE or CT scan. And uh, during this trial, and we will be sort of anxiously awaiting the results to, to see if uh, left atrial appendage occlusion is superior or inferior to uh, long-term anticoagulation in patients without uh, any problems with, uh, with taking long-term anticoagulation. So in conclusion, uh, you know, left atrial appendage closure is a safe and eff efficacious therapy currently for the selected patients. Um, you know, rapid development in technology will really allow the procedure to get more safer and more effective. We have already seen a huge, huge improvement uh, from before to now. And the future trials, such as Champion AF or Catalyst trial, uh, may show data that may drive use of it as a primary strategy, but that is certainly not proven at this point, and, and we will have to await the trial data. Uh, the surgical left atrial appendage closure during open heart surgery will continue to increase, and as, as trials such as LAOS-3 have shown, that it provides incremental benefit without adding much or no risk to the patients who are undergoing uh, open heart surgery, and certainly it will continue to grow. I think at Piedmont, uh, we are moving uh, from you know, general anesthesia to monitored anesthesia care from overnight stay to same day discharge, even over the last two to three years. So I think the field is rapidly developing. And I think there will be a place for anticoagulation, there will be a place for left atrial appendage closure, and there will remain a place for surgical left atrial appendage closure. And our hope is that as, as we learn more, uh, we are able to provide the best patient, the best therapy uh, by taking the heart team approach and evaluating their anatomy, their risk factors, and uh, uh, you know, their personal preferences to provide therapies that, that suit individual needs and wishes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. My contact information is here, and I hope you enjoy the video.